Well, today I want to talk to you uh, in a continual step of this series on Thanksgiving. Uh, what I wanted to do was to realize that Thanksgiving is not something we celebrate last weekend of November, but it really is an attitude that's very much connected to Christmas. And last week we looked at the whole idea that most miracles are preceded by a heart of Thanksgiving in the Bible. And when you look at Jesus, for example, in feeding the 5,000, he broke five loaves and two fish, but before he did so, he gave thanks to God. And then the miracle happened with Lazarus, who was dead. Before Lazarus was raised from the jet, dead, Jesus gave thanksgiving, and then the miracle occurred. So if you're looking for a Christmas miracle this year, let's begin with thanksgiving. Let's begin with the power of thanksgiving. Uh, today's message is basically this one. Thanksgiving is not a day of the year, Thanksgiving is a lifestyle that lasts throughout the year. Keep that in mind. Thanksgiving is not a day of the year. Thanksgiving is every day throughout the year. It's an attitude of mine. It's a lifestyle. So let's look at the power of Thanksgiving in another step today. And the whole message is centered around this theme. We are to give thanks in all things. Say that after me. We are to give thanks in all things. Not some things, a few things, but in all things. Out of reverence for the reading of the scripture, if you're able, would you now please stand? From Psalm 107, verse 1. Read it with me, in fact. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures how long? <laughs> Forever. Then Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 6, that thanksgiving should accompany every single one of our prayers. So whenever you pray to God, make sure that thanksgiving is a part of your prayer life. Read this with me. Paul said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Let thanksgiving always be included in every single one of your prayers. And finally, this is the text I'll spring upon and use mostly today. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Paul wrote, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in how many circumstances? In all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Mm. Mm. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. So it's pretty clear, isn't it, that we're to give thanks in how many things? <laughs> I know you hate it, but I looked up the word all in the dictionary this week. It means, <laughs> it means all. It means all, folks. And in everything, we are to give thanks to God for somehow he's working out his will in everything. It's easy to give thanks to God when things are really good. Marilyn and I had such an experience recently. Um, we learned that our son, Michael, we have three children, in case you don't know, there's Bethany, and she has four children with Ryan. He's a church planter. Uh, would you like to see their pictures, our four grandchildren? Anyway, they're beautiful, beautiful children. In fact, Caleb's birthday is today, our second grandson, who, who's four years old. And then interestingly, uh, David and Jesse are married. They don't have children yet. And then Michael is a senior at the University of Missouri. Well, Michael is a swimmer, and He's gotten to be pretty good, and he was invited to be a part of the World Championships in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, December 6th through 11th last week. Well, when we learned that he was one of 17 male swimmers invited to that event, we looked at the dates. I just went, honey, we, we can't go. Blast. Ugh. You know, the Waxhaw Campus opening last week, I need to be there for the first opening um, the staff Christmas parties during that time period. Um, it's just a bad time to go. We can't go. So Max Baumgartner, who's here today and is my right arm and trying to make things work, and he helped make this campus work. You really need to get to know him, a great man of God. When I told Max the scenario, he looked me straight in the eye and said, you got to go. You got to go. And then my assistant, Christina Wilking, who's here today, she looked at me and said, you, you, you got to go. And then one of our elders, Cleveland Sellers, was talking to me about it. He said, you got to go. And he got all the elders together, and they all got together and said, you got to go. Get out of here. You got to go. They covered for me with the class, uh, class, 
uh, Christmas party, staff Christmas party. They covered for me here, saying I'd come here this week instead of last week. They said, go. So Marilyn and I went to Windsor, Ontario, Canada last week and watched our son Michael, 21 years of old, swim against the best swimmers in the world. And, and we weren't expecting a whole lot. We were just hoping that he would not embarrass himself. You know how it is as parents, when your kid is a, a kid is in the goalie as a soccer kid, you know? And what are you praying? Please don't kick it to my kid. Please don't let it go in the goal. Don't let my kid fail. That was kind of our attitude last week. Well, there was one event, and, and you know, in swimming, they have long course, which is during the Olympic year. That's the long pool. Short course is half that pool, and that's during the off Olympic years, and that's the Olympic short course or world championships during this, this time period that we're presently going through. So we went, and there's one event that's short course that's not Olympic long course called the 4 by 50 200 mixed medley. It's men and women. And you can put any person with any stroke at any place in the one through four. And so they walk out after the introductions, and we notice that Michael, our son's swimming the 50 freestyle, the last leg as the anchor. And we're going, oh, God, please don't let them kick the ball to Michael, please. And we watched this event on national television, NBC, and, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. We wanted to share with you what happened. Watch this. Can we watch it again? <laughs> I don't know how many dozens of times Marilyn and I have already watched it. And each time we go, go, Michael, go, Michael. Go. You know, thinking you can't overtake that person. But, um, man, we, we were just in the stands, tears, and just so thankful. Just so thankful to God. It, it's easy to thank God in the good stuff, isn't it? I mean, when Michael won that, it's so easy to thank God. Wow. But the Bible teaches that we're not only supposed to thank God in the good times, the Bible teaches we're also to thank God during the bad times. In all things, in everything, give thanks. And what you might not know about our Michael is that when he was in sixth grade, um, he was cut from his middle school basketball team. Now, in a Chadwick household, that's not good news. Uh, his older brother was an All-State player, a Division I scholarship awardee, and of course, many of you know I played collegiately. Um, and when Michael got cut, it just devastated him. Now, he was beginning to swim and play basketball both, and it was really, really hard. And I went to talk to the coach. Why did he get cut? And the coaches basically said, he didn't play very well. So how do you go back to your son and say, he just didn't play very well, trying to give the excuse for why he didn't make the team? And yet, folks, him getting cut from that basketball team was what forced him to swim full time. That's when he gave up basketball and just devoted himself to swimming. And you see where he's come. So the worst thing that happened to him during that time period became what? The best thing that could happen to him. So we thanked God at that time, trying to learn how to do this. Thank you, Lord, he didn't make it. We trust you. What you might not know as well is that Michael that morning swam the 50 free individually. And you have to make the top eight to have a chance for the medal. He finished ninth. And Marilyn went, are you kidding me, Lord? And then we had to say, Ugh. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for ninth. Thank you, Lord, for ninth. Because you're in it somehow, working your will out. I think that's partly what motivated him that night to swim so well, but thank you, Lord. Thank you. And then that next day, after he got the Olympic gold, I mean, excuse me, the world championship gold, he swam the 100 free, which is his best event. And he finished 16th. My first response, oh, come on. Thank you, Lord, for 16th. Because somehow you're in it and working all things together for good. In, in front of Marilyn and me was a gentleman from Libya. And this was another powerful moment for me. He had a huge Libyan flag. And his son was in the 100 free where Michael finished 16th. And his son finished 88th. And when his meet was over, it was posted on the board, he finished 88th. The man's jumping up and down, waving his Libyan flag like this. And he's screaming out, my son finished 88th! My son finished 88th! Then he puts the flag down, starts blowing kisses to his son on the pool deck. My son finished 88th! And I'm sitting there going, Lord, give me that kind of sense of thanksgiving. 
that if Michael finishes 88, I'm blowing kisses to him. Because somehow, you're in it. Somehow, you're working everything together for good. Somehow, your will is being done. Now, you need to know, I don't think you're supposed to give thanks for things like cancer, things like child abuse, gang killings, forcing yourself on someone. I don't think we're supposed to give thanks for that because they're never a part of God's original intent. God didn't create the world with that kind of evil. It's part of the fall and the brokenness of our world. But though we don't give thanks for those things happening, we give thanks for God working even through those. That's what we do. So, so Gentry and Hadley Eddings go through the nightmare every parent fears. They lose two boys, one just about ready to be born, the second two years old. It's a tragic automobile accident. It should never have happened, but it did. And I don't want to minimize their grief. They're still struggling some. This is their second Christmas without the two boys. So you can imagine what the memories happen whenever they go through these kind of times. But if Gentry was here today, here's what he would say. I I don't give thanks for the accident in itself. I I think that's evil. It's a part of the broken world in which we live. But I give thanks for how God is using it for good. And in Haiti right now, there's a school that's been built with those two boys' name on it. And I'm sure there are some days Gentry and Hadley go, I'm not sure it's a fair trade, but then when they think about eternity, there are literally thousands upon thousands of spiritual children that will be birthed into the kingdom because of the loss of Dobbs and Reed. And when I saw Hadley down in Haiti a couple months ago holding two little Haitian boys in her arms and kissing them on the cheek, I went, okay, Lord, You're working through this in ways we can't begin to understand, but you are. So Gentry would tell you today, and he's the campus pastor at Ballantyne, I give thanks for that, Lord, for the ways you're working it together for your will. It's hard to understand, but it's a powerful spiritual tool Folks, we talk about spiritual disciplines like prayer and and fasting. Here's a spiritual discipline that's often overlooked. It's the powerful spiritual discipline of giving thanks to God during the bad times. It is a tool, the enemy, and we do have an enemy of our souls, don't we? Who hates us, wants to destroy us. When we give thanks to God in the bad times, things that he is the author of. God's not the author of evil. The evil one is when we give thanks during those times, he says, you mean I did that to you and you still love God? And you still give thanks to him and you still praise him? It thwarts and neuters his power like nothing else. It's a spiritual discipline to choose to give thanks to God in the bad times. Now, let me share with you what I think is the opposite of thanksgiving that my bet is will touch every single one of us today. The opposite of thanksgiving is complaining. And God hates complaining because the major reason that God allows the bad stuff to happen, he's sovereign over it and he's using it for good. The major reason he lets it happen in your life is so you won't complain and you'll be driven deeply into him. God's goal for every one of our lives, mine especially, is to drive me deeply into Christ. It's to drive us into him where we totally and finally surrender everything to him. Where we live in complete dependence upon him and nothing else in this world. Where we say, be still and know that I am God regularly in our hearts. I'm going to cease striving, and I'm going to trust you, Lord, totally and completely. Are you there yet? We cling to such puny things of this world, the tawdry baubles of this kingdom that don't last forever. 
And God wants to pry our puny fingers away from the things of this world that don't last and grasp him and him alone. Giving thanks in all things allows that to happen. When you wait upon the Lord and you don't have what you want, you learn the spiritual discipline of waiting, you're practicing giving thanks in all things. And then you're trusting God to work it out in his plan, in his way. But be careful about complaining. It's the opposite of thanksgiving. In fact, Paul in Philippians 2 verse 14 said, do all things without grumbling or disputing or or complaining. Do, I hate that word all, don't you? (laughs) We're never supposed to complain, never. But let me give you some facts. And this comes from psychology today. Not from the Bible, though all truth is God's truth. Here's some facts about complaining. First of all, scientists have studied complaining and that every single human being complains of at least once every minute. Every minute, it becomes a habit within us. And and here's what happens in your brain when you start to complain. Your neurons fire whenever you express any emotion, especially one that's negative. And if one keeps happening over and over again, there's a a phrase that scientists use, um, if your brain fires it, it wires it. If your brain fires it, it wires it. So when you think a negative thought, especially complaining, your brain fires it, and, and the more you do it, the more the neurons start massing outward and they start building bridges to one another so that complaining becomes a habit. It's something you do all the time. What you need to know though is complaining has serious consequences, first of all, to your physical health. The place in the brain where those neurons fire and start to build bridges to one another is the place in your brain where Alzheimer's most happens. So maybe one of the cures to Alzheimer's is learning how to give thanks in all things. When you start having those neurons fire more and more, they release into your body cortisol. And for those of you who are physically smart, you know cortisol is what's released when you go into a fight or flight mode. It's your body's way of giving you what you need when you're in a tough situation, either to face it or to run away. But too much cortisol can cause all kinds of problems in your human body. It's been directly related to belly fat. It's directly related to diabetes. It's directly related to high cholesterol. (laughs) It's directly related to heart disease. You get the picture? That complaining causes bad physical health. It also causes relational problems. There's something in social science called neural mirroring. What's that? It's whenever someone releases an emotion they're feeling, it causes others to be drawn to it. There's a good neural mirroring. What's that? It's empathy. When you have someone who expresses something to you that's painful in their lives, you're drawn to enter into their world and try to help them, right? That's a good thing. But when it's complaining, it initially draws people to you And in a bad way, the person drawn to you starts mirroring the very neural imaging, the complaining that's going on. So that a person who's drawn into that complaining becomes a what? A complainer. Think of secondhand smoke. You're in a place where one or two or five people are smoking and you inhale that smoke, you start to take on potentially the very symptoms of that smoke in their lives in your own. 
So when you're around complaining people, either you'll be drawn into it and start complaining yourself, and then what you do is you have a huge pity party with your friends. And that person will stay with you probably for a season. Then afterwards, isn't this true? They get tired of the negativism and the complaining and the downers, and eventually, what happens? They leave. I can't speak for you, but I want to be surrounded by people who believe in my dreams, who have hopes in what God may do in my life, who think positive about who I am and my future. And when I'm with complaining people, I show empathy, but after a while I leave. So there is a relational damage to complaining. It may for a moment allow somebody to enter into your pity party, but eventually you'll be isolated and left alone. That's why God hates complaining. It has physical ramifications, emotional ramifications, relational ramifications. If you remember, God freed the Israelites from the captivity of the Egyptians. He parted the Red Sea. They got to the other side. The Egyptians were all killed, and they throw one praise party. Thanksgiving is everywhere around them. They thank God for his deliverance. It's beautiful. And then they go out into the wilderness, and suddenly food is a bit scarce. There's not much water. And what do they start doing? They start, what, folks? Complaining. And God listens to it, and after a while he says, okay, you complain, you remain. You complain, you remain. And what do you do? 40 laps around the wilderness for 40 years until they died off and a new generation filled with faith came to the fore. You see, folks, complaining is unbelief verbalized. Complaining is unbelief verbalized, and God hates unbelief. But thanksgiving is faith verbalized. Thanksgiving is faith verbalized. And thanksgiving is saying to God, no matter what's going on, I thank you because I know somehow, some way, though it's tough, you're in it, you're working through it, it's for good. I may not see it for a while, but I trust you. I'm totally dependent upon you. I surrender everything to you. And thanksgiving replaces complaining which is where God wants us to be, and gives us several key things. First of all, an inward spiritual happiness. The cortisol is not released like it is. And those wonderful positive endorphins are released with our thanksgiving, and we live in personal happiness. There is the reality of improved relationships because positive people, people filled with joy and thanksgiving, draw positive people There's the personal health improvement, obviously. And finally, there is enhanced performance. For if you have more energy, you have a clearer mind, you'll make better decisions, and at work, you will achieve better success. So there's a practical reason to be thankful, isn't there? That's why God instructs so clearly in his word, do everything without grumbling or complaining. And in everything, give thanks to God, for this is his will for you. He's working out his will even in the bad stuff. So it's easy to praise God in the good stuff, isn't it? It's harder in the bad stuff. But it's a spiritual discipline, a surrender to God. And when it's done, folks, it has enormous physical, mental, emotional, spiritual benefits for us all. So this Christmas, this Christmas, let me exhort all of you to learn the power of thanksgiving. You want to start in a new way? Please tell me yes. You do? Okay. You want to start in a new way? Here's how you can start to practice the power of thanksgiving in all things. Let's start with Christmas. First of all, give thanks to God for the cradle. Give thanks to God for that baby born in the cradle. Did you ever think about the reality that you didn't have to negotiate with God for him to send his son into the world? He didn't beg him or coerce him. He did so by his own 
divine election. <laughs> By his love, he saw the state of your bitterness, anger, resentment, all that separated you from him, and he pursued you first. And the evidence is the cradle. So thank God this Christmas for the cradle, that God initiated his love for you. Then remember, really Christmas is always connected to Easter. Thank God for the cross, that that baby grew up and became a man. And this man, Jesus, God in human flesh, lived the perfect life that none of us could ever live. He went to a cross to die for the forgiveness of our sins, taking our sin upon him and giving us the forgiveness of our sins. Thank God this Christmas for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've given your life to Jesus, you don't need to live in that guilt and shame anymore. Isn't that good news? It's all taken upon him. Thank God for the cross. And thank God for the conquest. Because three days after Jesus died, he was raised from the dead. Yes, there have been plenty of people who have come back from life after death, but they've only been resuscitated. They've had to face death again, haven't they? But Jesus is the only man who's ever lived who was resurrected and never faced death again. And that resurrection proves he's God. And if God died for yours and my sins, that means they're truly forgiven. You can't keep a good God down. The resurrection proves the enormous love of God for you and me. So this Christmas, thank God for the conquest, the resurrection, the proof that his love is stronger than our sin. No matter what you've done. I don't care what you've done to disappoint God. An abortion, if you've even stolen from somebody, it's not greater than the love of God. You're forgiven. So thank God for that resurrection. And finally, the crown. The cradle, the cross, the conquest, and the crown. Thank God for, as you're faithful to him, somehow, some way, when we get to heaven, (laughs) we're going to get a crown. A glorious crown. A reward for having served him. So begin there, will you? This Christmas... Develop an attitude of gratitude. Thank God for all things, the good and the bad. When you do, it drives you deeply into him, and you know the power of the cradle, the cross, the conquest, and the crown.